Well, welcome to the third part of this RDWorks Learning Lab concerning lenses. Basically, we're trying to carry out an Iron Man test for lenses to see, which, to see if we can sort out the men from the boys. Now, as you probably know, there is no significant planning going into any of these sessions. It's all very much, let's try it and see. There was a little bit of thought that went into this exercise about maybe how I should try and test lenses for cutting. I thought, yeah, that's pretty simple and straightforward. But here I am today, faced with the task, and thinking, hey, this is going to be a nightmare. I think before we can test the lenses, I really ought to sum up lots of individual sessions that I've carried out over the past couple of years to try and explain what cutting is. Now, apart from anything else, this is going to be quite a nice workout for my new head here. Um, because, you know, there's going to be tubes, lenses, in, out. We're going to be swapping around. We're going to be doing all sorts of things today. So we'll see just how durable and um, how flexible this system is. I want to thank Scott Thorne for, for reminding me of something that I already was aware of. But I thought, well, I can bring this into today's session because it's a very convenient way of demonstrating one or two points. That the nozzle system off of my old head has got the same M21 by one thread on it that fits this system as well. We should be able to have the flexibility of at least three types of nozzle to play with. I think we're going to start off with just a very simple little demonstration and then we'll go looking at some of the theory and the problems and the things that might crop up as we get further into this session. Well, the first thing we've got to decide is what particular material are we going to be using for this test? Acrylic, nice material, but hey, we're using a 38.1 millimeter lens throughout this test. And we know that these lenses will push right the way down with a nice straight line purely because of the internal reflection of the material. So that's really not going to be much of a test for cutting. So we rule out acrylic. Now, thin materials like MDF, this three millimeter MDF hardboard, or this three millimeter plywood, well, that's a bit like paddling pool stuff. It's far too easy for a lens. So we need to push that aside. Now we've got some real wood here this is a sort of a pine and yeah it's pretty thick and I think it's probably too much of a challenge for a 38 millimeter lens this just about pushes through with more power and a two inch lens we've got to remain in the realms of possible and here we've got some 10 millimeter thick plywood now it is quite soft plywood it's probably poplar or something like that now it's not a very dense plywood and I'm sure we should be able to use this with a, a one and a half inch lens you may say well that's stupid because a one and a half inch lens won't go through 10 millimeter plywood its focus is just totally wrong well you may be right but I think we need to sit down and discuss the theory of wood cutting because you might be surprised now before we go anywhere near our lenses, because we've now chosen wood as our base material for testing, we need to understand how wood reacts to laser light. What are the factors that could affect the performance of our lens? Because what, we tried to, what we've got to do is produce a set of constant factors where the only thing that varies in the equation of cutting is the lens itself. And that's a lot more difficult than it immediately appeared to me. So the first thing we're going to do is to examine how wood cuts. Now I'm just going to pulse this piece of wood. Well the first and obvious observation is the black mark. The second thing I hope you saw was the puff of smoke which caught fire. What we're left with here is a little black area now this black area is basically wood that has been removed and the only thing left after you've removed the cellulose is this black stuff, if I scratch it very carefully 
is only very very thin and you can see the, war, the, the raw wood underneath it still. So what I want you to do now is to watch what happens when I hold the pulse on. I want you to watch this middle section here and you'll see that it glows white hot. Now I can't blow that flame out. I've got white spots in front of my eyes now, like looking at the sun. If we look what we've got, we've got black carbon. The cellulose burns away with the resins and the oils that are in the wood and they produce a smoke. But the smoke is inflammable and the laser beam is creating heat within the smoke and it sets fire to the smoke. So what we've done, we've burnt away the and scorched the cellulose part, the delicate part of the wood and what's been left behind is carbon, charcoal. Now carbon does not burn. Carbon heats up to 3500 degrees C and then just turns into a gas, poof, disappears. And that's what's happening here. So we've got a two-stage process when we burn wood. We very quickly burn off the volatile parts of the wood and just leave behind the carbon. But the energy in the laser beam is sufficient to raise the temperature of the carbon up to 3500 degrees C. Now I must stress again that what we're firing at here is a beam of light, a beam of energy, pure energy. There is no heat in the beam itself. The beam is energy which excites the molecules that are in this surface here. While it's wood, it excites the molecules. At, a, at about 300 degrees C, the molecules burn. They disappear. They, they do what they want at 300 degrees C. And what they do, they leave the carbon behind. But the carbon won't do anything until it gets up to 3,500 degrees C. So what happens is the molecules in the carbon get excited and more excited and even more excited as they get bombarded by more and more of this light which they react to. And their temperature goes up to 3,500 degrees and then they do something, pff, disappear. The point I'm trying to make here is, and I keep stressing this every time so that you understand what this laser beam is. It's like a rock falling from space. That rock is completely harmless. Like this laser beam, is completely harmless until it hits you on the head. And when it hits you on the head, there's an energy transfer. Just like there's an energy transfer when the laser beam hits this surface. Now that's the best example I can give you that may give you some sort of conceptual feeling of how this tr energy transfer operates. Okay, so now here we've got a one and a half inch lens and we're going to take this unfocused beam that we saw here at the top and we're going to pass it through a lens which basically is an energy amplifier. It takes the light and it concentrates it down into a very small dot on the surface there. So we've got exactly the same amount of energy that we've got here but it's just been turned from something like this where it doesn't hurt at all to something like this which if I applied the same amount of energy to that end would hurt my finger. So we've got more potential to damage or hurt the material now and so what we're going to do is watch carefully and see what happens when I fire a little pulse at that. Right now we're getting a bit closer so you've got a good view because blink and you will miss this. Now look, in less than a tenth of a second, we've burnt a hole through there. I don't know how long it actually took, but it was an incredibly short period of time. 
and we've produced a hole that's gone right through the wood. Now that gives you an idea of how much energy intensification has taken place. We hardly burnt through halfway in what maybe five seconds of burning but in a tenth of a second we've gone right the way through. Although it only took one tenth of a second to burn through and produce that hole that was not a continuous action. What was happening here was exactly the same as happening here and what happened here was we've got the surface molecules being agitated by the light. Those surface molecules heated up and we burnt the cellulose away, leaving carbon behind. The thin film of carbon then heated up and evaporated, leaving wood underneath it, which then at 300 degrees C evaporated, leaving a thin film of carbon underneath, which then heated up to 3,500 degrees C and disappeared, leaving wood behind. So we've got this continual layering process of burning. We've got exactly the same action taking place to make that hole as we had to burn that big patch there. It is a woodpecker action. You don't instantly cut a hole. I can't be sure, but I'm pretty confident that when I take that lens out, you can see the distance that we are away from the lens. Well, let's just take a look very carefully on the underneath side of that lens when I flip it out. Hey, I've caught that in the light now. Can you see that debris, that condensate that's formed on the front of the lens there? That's from just one shot. And that's why it's important to make sure that you always protect your lens with air assist. Because even at that distance, I've got debris that's squirted up and, and condensed on the face of the lens. So before I put this lens away, I'm just going to have to clean it with some isopropyl alcohol. Then as the second stage of cleaning this lens, we must always remove the film that's on the surface with some lens cleaning tissue. Well, I'm not going to be quite as stupid the next time. What I'm going to do is mount a one and a half inch lens into a nozzle. So to start off with, we've got an empty lens tube here and we're going to put this one and a half inch lens back into the machine. Now having demonstrated to you how sensitive the lens is to being what I call smoked, what we're going to do is we're going to turn the air assist on. I basically don't want air assist on to do the next part of this test. But what I'm going to do is do, I've got my air assist on already, and we're going to pop the nozzle into that little bucket of water there. We should be able to see what's going on inside that water there. Now what I'm going to do is very gradually open up my air assist valve on the top here, and you can see I can open it up just a shade, because what I want is just a few little bubbles of air like that. So hopefully that should be enough airflow to protect the lens. So what we're trying to observe now is the difference between, between having air assist on while we pierce our way through this material. Right, well now we're just going to give this a very, very quick pulse. Beep. And what happened? Well, if we take a look underneath here, we can see the merest pinprick of a dot there. We've got here a dot that's maybe, what, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 diameter. And here we've got a dot which has come out the bottom at maybe 0 0.01, 0 0.02. Very small, about a tenth of the size. Now, what I'm going to do is the same thing again but I'm going to leave the pulse on just a fraction longer. Okay, so there's our pulse on the front. It's got a bit of a halo around it, but it's probably still about 0.3 diameter. And on the back, more or less the same size, look. But without the halo. So we've produced a parallel hole through there, 
by giving just a fraction more time to the energy that's being fired at that. Now I'm going to try and give this the merest pulse again. And we shall see that what we've got, we've got about a 0 0.2, 0 0.3 hole on the top and something underneath which is not much different. So we've got a bigger hole underneath now with our air assist. Let's just do it a little bit longer. And now we've got the same size hole top and bottom with the air assist. And here's our thick wood. The first thing that's obviously going to happen is it's going to excite the molecules on the surface here, heat them up and produce some smoke. It's then going to leave a film of carbon behind which will disappear as it heats up to 3500 degrees C. It then pecks away at another little piece of clean wood underneath and produces more smoke. Right? So as we cut through here we're going to produce smoke. Smoke might appear to be nothing to you guys but if you think about it smoke is the only reason you can see smoke and you can't see air is because air is a gas and smoke is not a gas smoke is a mixture of a gas and solid particles those solid particles are refracting and reflecting the light they are solid particles of material that have been ejected from the cut area now these solid particles are prone to be heated by the laser so before that once you start generating smoke the first thing that will happen is all these micro particles will start absorbing your energy heating up in their own right and catching fire because they're being heated up and turned into carbon and evaporating so we're already using the energy of the beam to actually clear, help clear and destroy the smoke. And that's not what we want. We really want the energy of this beam to just carry on with our woodpecker action and not try and destroy the smoke. But of course, the first thing that happens is as we're woodpecking our way through the wood, we're always going to produce smoke. And if you look at any cut that you produce, you will always see that where you start your cut, let's just draw a square on there for a moment like that. Now you'll see that where you start your cut, even if you've got a super clean cut all the way round, you'll still find in this area here that you've got some browning. And that's because of this effect. We're trying to pierce our way through, but we can't get rid of the smoke. It has to come upwards because there is no other way for that smoke to escape while we're piercing through. Now I know that piercing takes place almost instantaneously, but the process is one of creating smoke. Okay, so that's the start point. We'll always have this problem at the very start. And if you want a really nice clean cut, then what you must do is put a lead in so that you start off out there and then come in and run round your product. Once we've got our through cut established, We've now got somewhere, as we move forward, in this direction here, we shall start pecking away at more clean material. But as, we've got pecking, as we're pecking away at this clean material now, what we've got, we've got somewhere, we've got a, a little tube down here, or a little gully, the kerf as they call it, which could be only 0 0.1 or at the most 0 0.2 millimetres wide. Now bear in mind you've got a hair there which is around about 0 0.025 so four hairs wide roughly is the width of the, of the cut that you're producing. Now we don't want smoke down here in this cut because if we have got smoke in this cut remember what smoke is smoke is actually absorbing our energy and preventing us from cutting efficiently. So what we need to do is to get rid of the smoke. As soon as the smoke is produced, we need to eject it. And we don't need to eject it upwards, we need to inject it downwards.
And the way that we do that is to make sure that we put air flow through the kerf, which is, remember, only this wide, very, very narrow. So the way to get efficient cutting is to make sure that we keep the smoke flowing out of the bottom of the cut at all stages. If it comes upwards, it means we're not doing a very good job. So if you cut too fast, you may well find that you're, and I'm now going to change view, we now might produce, and I'm going to grossly exaggerate this, we may be producing a cut that looks like that, where we're able to get airflow in the top, but not at the bottom. The airflow at the bottom will be strangled by the virtue of the fact that we've got almost no cut width at the bottom. Now this might only be 0.2 wide, but this at the bottom here might be 0.01. Enough for the piece to fall out because it's a clear cut, but not enough to get your airflow cleanly and efficiently out of the bottom. So airflow through cutting wood is the most important thing that you can do. The problem is, how do we get the airflow into such a narrow cut? We've got various lenses here, which may have slightly different focal distances. This distance here could be vitally important to the performance of these lenses. Now, I don't want the lenses to be influenced by distance X. So now you can see why I'm a bit concerned. I thought this was a simple task, but it's not a simple task to test these lenses comparatively to find out how they perform in a cutting function. Why am I saying that 10 millimeters is a serious challenge for these lenses? This is approximately scaled up to about 10 millimeters. And this here is 38.1. These beams here show you the problem that we're faced with. Only at this point here am I going to have concentrated energy. After that, and with a 38.1 lens, we've got less than probably plus or minus, I think it's about 0.4 of a millimetre. So we've got a very narrow working range after which the average energy density drops off badly. So if the energy is sufficient to burn through at the surface there, as we've seen with this little sample here, okay, so we've got what may be a 0.1 or 0.2 diameter hole there, and what we've got on the back is the merest little pinprick, maybe 0.01. So how on earth, if I can get that sort of variation in a piece of three mm material, three millimeter material, how am I ever going to get through a piece of 10 millimeter thick material. Because look, all the energy density is disappearing. I'm never gonna be able to burn through the bottom of that. Let's go and investigate that a little bit further because this is a serious challenge for any lens, but particularly for a 38 point one. see the two marks there, look, the very small micro mark beside the one when I gave it more time. Note the diameter of that big black mark. It's about, what, 0.2 diameter? And on the other side, about 0.2. How can that be possible? The beam is spreading out. If that's 10 millimetres, our beam has spread out to probably best part of 5 millimetres here at the bottom. But we've got a 0.2 entry hole and a 0.2 exit hole. OK, we've had to allow a little bit more time. But we're going to ask the question, why is that possible? We've got our energy profile here. Our maximum energy density, if we've got the beam set up correctly, is taking place in this area here, towards the center of the beam itself, the center of the lens. And at this point, right down the center, we've got maximum energy. And we're not getting any divergence of that energy. All this other energy outside here is helping us to improve the energy density 
and the amount of energy that we put into the cut. But this energy down the centre here is still high energy. And it is that high energy that allows us to pierce through thick material, even though we've got a short focal length lens. The energy down the centre remains high, but it's a little bit on the scarce side, so we have to take more time. That's why I'm saying that this is a challenging material. If our lens is actually working well at the centre, then it will do a good job of cutting. This stuff at the outside here becomes very incidental after the first one or two millimetres because it has already dissipated and we've got such low energy density there that we can't actually do any burning with it. All we can do is scorch with it. And that's what will happen to your cut. You'll get charring and scorching. So the aim of the exercise is to run as fast as we can to allow this central beam to do its job, but we run fast enough so that this low energy stuff does not get long enough time to seriously scorch and char our cut. Now charring of the cut is a two-stage process. Number one, if you leave the smoke in the cut, the smoke will catch fire and it will char your cut. So number one, we've got to keep the smoke moving. And number two, we've got to keep the cut moving as fast as possible. And that's how we should get a nice clean finish on our thick, impossible wood cut. Okay, so we've got one more real serious parameter to question and understand and that's the air assist itself. Now, you might think that just blowing air at the cut is good enough. And some people have asked me, how big a compressor can, should I get? What pressure should I be using? My answer is always, don't worry about getting a big compressor. The one that they gave you with the machine, which is absolutely puny, is still probably 10 times bigger than what you need. And people just don't believe me. I've already doubled the size of my compressor from what was originally supplied. And I've established that I don't need it. Now, what I need to do is to convince you guys of the same thing. It's not the air pressure that you need. It's the amount of air that you can get into this very, very narrow cut. Now, there are two ways that you can get that air into the cut. One of them is a way that I'm going to show you now. I'm going to turn on my air assist and you can hear it hissing nicely. Now, as I lower the work, you can hear it getting quieter. So distance to the work has a serious effect. I can play with these lenses now quite significantly and this particular setup here is a three millimeter clearance. So the focus is set at three millimeters. I've got maximum air assist on. But that maximum air assist is passing through the hole in the end of that nozzle there which is about two and a half millimeters diameter. Lots of air assist. Hopefully we're not going to get any of this horrible brown effect that most people get when they do cutting. Now I'm running this at seven millimeters a second. It's 10 millimeter thick material, remember, and this is a 38.1, an inch and a half focal length lens. I should not be able to cut this according to some experts. I'm going to turn my fan on before I gas myself. And there's what we've produced. It's virtually falling out, and in fact it would have fallen out, and it's absolutely perfectly clear all the way around except that point that I mentioned to you, look, at the start point, where we have to go in and squirt the gas upwards. 
Now, once we've started, what we've done, we've pushed with high pressure, relatively speaking, the gas all the way out the bottom of the cut, and we've got nothing coming out the top of the cut here. All right? Now, let's turn it over and see what the effect is on the back. The only reason it hasn't fallen out, and it's a good thing that it hasn't fallen out, the back is pretty clean as well, except just here, in this area, the last corner, sorry, this was the first corner because it started off here and went round. Okay, because this is the last corner here, look where it came up here and it didn't quite finish. This is effectively beam drag. The bottom of the beam has been cutting later than the top of the beam. And so it's left this little tab in here, which is good because it's held the job in. If it had fallen out, it would have made a bit of a mess on here, which I'll explain to you in a minute. This generally, to me, indicates that we're not going fast enough. Seven millimeters a second, we probably can go faster. So let's take this out for a minute. We'll just pop that off there. And let's look at the edge that we've produced. Now that's not bad. It's got a shiny finish on it. One of the tests that seems to tell me um, whether or not we're getting close to the correct speed of cut is this test. How much charring and black can I pull off when I wipe a crease of kitchen towel across it? The answer is not very much. The blacker it is, the faster it indicates you could go, generally. Now, that doesn't look badly shaped, does it? It's a little bit hollow in the middle, but essentially that doesn't show any sign of, what can I say, divergence because of the power of the lens disappearing. OK, that from 7mm a second, we're going to go up to 8mm a second now. As I forecast to you, we've more or less got rid of the burning here. There's just the merest hint of scorching here, which indicates that we probably could go just a shade faster. Look at the colour of that wood. It's getting to a lovely brown colour. We've still got virtually no hint of any coloration on there. It's virtually char free. We'll ratchet the speed up once more. Well, it's still producing a nice cut and look, it's still ready to fall out. Look at that, virtually nothing. Superb. And that means we could probably go even faster. Now we had some smoke come up onto the top there. Did you notice that? Now that's a sign to me that we've now reached a critical point and we're no longer pushing smoke out the bottom. We may well have got away with the cut. No, we haven't. So now we've gone one step too far. So if you can get really close to the work with your airflow, then you probably can force an efficient amount of air into your cut. Now unfortunately airflow is something that you can't really see. But I've devised a very simple method that allows you to look at your airflow. Now here we can see the air dancing around. And you can see that it's what? Maybe 12, 15 millimeters diameter approximately. Now as I start lifting it towards here, several things happen. First of all, we're getting a slightly bigger airflow. It's actually not bad at all, considering it's quite high pressure. We're getting a fairly consistent size, even a long way off. Can you see how that remains fairly consistent? I'm going to do is to reduce that flow. Now that all of a sudden becomes something called laminar flow. Now if I raise that up I should probably find that it hardly changes at all. You can't really see it. It's 
got a wide range over which that little circle remains very consistent. Now I've reduced the airflow to almost, not almost nothing, there's a very significant flow there still. The question is, how much does that affect the cutting? We know what the limit is, nine millimeters a second. We'll leave the speed at 10 millimeters a second because we know that this one failed at 10 millimeters a second. And this one is failing as well because look, the smoke is coming up onto the top surface. Not quite as good. Not a huge difference, but not as good. So let's drop the speed down to nine millimeters a second. Well, it's not terrible, it's not clean. Look, it's hanging up along the bottom here, but it probably would come out. It's only hanging in there by the merest threads. And then we do a white test on it, and it's pretty good. So I've got something here that will allow me to measure the flow coming out of that nozzle. Eight litres a minute. Okay. Now I'm going to change things round very slightly and probably improve the situation by not going all the way through the machine. So we'll take my air assist pipe off here and we'll connect it up directly to the pump. Then we'll take a look at the airflow that's coming out of the nozzle. So we've managed to get that flow now up to 11 litres a minute from 8 litres a minute. Let's see whether we can make the magic 10 millimetres a second. We'll have a look at our results. So there we are. That's about eight litres a minute. This is probably about five litres a minute. And this is uh, 11 litres per minute. We've very nearly achieved a good cut. It's very, very neat and nice underneath here. And I would probably be able to pop that out very easily. Now, there's, there's, <laughs> there's not a hint of any sort of charring on this last one. I think at the eight litres a minute ought to be our standard, and we should be using a constant gap of three millimetre focus. So if the lens doesn't quite come to three millimetres for its ideal focus, I shall have to set it in and out within the lens tube to make it exactly three millimetres. So we're gradually zooming in on the parameters for our test. And what we shall do is we'll keep everything constant, put the lens in, and we'll find out at what speed we can't cut. I mean, that's a, that's a good judge of how much power we're getting through the lens. Now, this is not total power, remember. This is power right down the centre of the lens. And technically, as far as I can see, the focal performance of the lens, whether it focuses into a point or not, should make no difference at all. It's only going to be based on the transmission efficiency through the lens itself. The transmission efficiency that I was looking at was based upon the total collected energy after the lens. This is not total energy after the lens. This is the energy that's coming right down the center of the lens that's causing this. And that might be something completely different. So now that we've established parameters for doing the test, I'm happy to go ahead and set up every lens exactly the same and find out what sort of results we get. Now I'm not going to subject you to the boredom of that. You've seen the method now and how I've developed the method. So I should go forth and spend a few hours cutting out squares. Now when we look at my table we've got another indication of how efficiently I was cutting because here 
the air assist was not working very well at all. Over here we had the air assist and we had a good cut coming all the way through. This horrible brown sticky stuff is what would normally go into your honeycomb table. It's the condensed tar that's coming out of the cut, the smoke. And smugly he boasts, it's not a problem to me. Just a little bit of acetone. Problem solved. Okay, it's results time. Now there were definitely winners and losers in the dot test. And most of the zinc selenide lenses when we were talking about the power transmission tests were all about the same at around about 95%. There wasn't a lot to choose between any of the lenses. The only lens that stood out in the power test was the gallium arsenide lens, which was an interesting surprise. Now, I think we're going to have some surprises here as well when we look through these results. I have not taken these apart. These are just as I've tested them, and so I still don't know what's happening inside. I did the tests and I stopped when they started to fail. So in this particular instance what we can see is clearly this one failed because it's got the browning around the edge. The smoke is coming upwards and the air assist is blowing it back down onto the work. So all these were set up according to our standard test procedures. They were about three millimeter focal distance. Some of them were two and a half and some of them were three and a half, but I considered that plus or minus half a mil was not a big issue. Here's test number one, and here's the lens that performed that test. Now, you may or may not be able to see this, but on the corner of each test before I did it, I tried to set the focus up exactly using my little dot test. Now, these are both set up to their ideal focus points, but is it my eyes? I haven't physically checked these, but that looks like a wider gap than these, even when I set these out. Now these in here have not. They're, they're going to come out because they're held down by a little bit at the back. But these, look, they're, they're almost falling out. And the falling out tells me that there isn't much beam drag on there at all, because the corner has, is not holding it and retaining it. So this was the USA meniscus lens. Not a lot of difference between these, eight, nine and 10 millimeters a second. And when we turn them over, as we can see, there's nothing holding that one in. Just a little bit there. The, on the back they are comparing fairly well. That one is definitely worse in terms of its power than this one because look this one is nearly through but I stopped because it didn't fall out. I think I'll use that one as a basic comparison because that is the most expensive lens and you would expect the best performance from that. Now the next lens in the frame was this PDV China meniscus lens. Very nice clean results even when it failed, as I think it probably must have done, at 10 millimetres. And when we look at the back, this one is actually only just failing, whereas this one failed completely. And again, is it my eyes or are these lines a lot thinner than those? This is a Plano convex lens and compares exactly with that one, which is a Plano convex lens. The only difference is the material. Now we did find that the gallium arsenide had got a slightly better performance when it came to transmitting power. But my goodness me, look at the difference here. I mean these, look, it's actually dropping out. I haven't touched these at the moment, but let's take a look at the back and see what's going on. So that was eight, nine, 10, 11, just the merest little hang up there, look. 12, there's a few hairy threads all the way around. And I regarded 13 as being the beginning of a failure. But as you can see, it's nowhere near as much of a failure as this one. So the gallium arsenide is a bit of a surprise, a dark horse. 
Now this one is really going to knock your socks off. I think this is probably the cheapest lens of the lot. And look at it. And it's not just nearly breaking through. I'm going to lift this off. I haven't touched these, by the way. This is exactly as... Look, these, these are all ready to drop out. Let's turn it over and have a look. So again, we've got this characteristic that I described to you before, that when you, get, when you run too slowly, you get burning underneath. Okay, when you start running faster, you get a cleaner cut underneath. So that was 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, just a hint of failure at 13, and 14 was still not as much as failure there as 10 was there. This is something extraordinary as far as a lens performance is concerned. The cheapest lens of the lot appears to be the best cutting lens. You wouldn't normally want to use a 38mm lens for cutting 10mm material, but we did because it was a means of checking the threshold of cutting. I decided to extend this test a little bit. On my light blade machine, I also had a gallium arsenide 2-inch lens, so I thought, that would be an interesting exercise to see just what a two inch gallium arsenide lens can do. Don't be fooled by the number of squares on there. These run eight to 14 and these run 10, 12, 14, 16, nearly 18. So here we are again with a cheap Chinese two inch focal length lens. Eight, nine, 10. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Well, we're nearly at the same value as this 16. Let's take a look at that 16 gallium arsenide. As I said, 10, 12, 14, 16, 17. And this is 16. Now look, I've taken all the pieces out of that two inch China lens. And I hope you can see that as I stack them up in order, how as I get faster and faster, the colour gets lighter and lighter. The burning, the charring gets less. Now I'm going to do the same thing for all the others and we can take a quick look at how they all compare. I purposely set these up so that the grain, the plies, all sit the same way. You can clearly see the pattern of lightness growing as we get faster on every one of these sets. The the ones that didn't go too well at the front here, there's not a lot of difference in the colour as you go through, but there is a big difference between the colour of these and the colour of these two here that came out. I mean, I think without any shadow of a doubt, the most expensive lens here has been the worst performer, and, and I just can't explain that. There was nothing special about that lens. I purposely cleaned it very carefully before I put it in, as I did with all these lenses. So these were all pristine condition before I tested them. Well, I think the only way you can really sum this up is the cheapest lens, whether it be two inches or inch and a half, seems to win this battle hands down. Now, every time I have a wrestling match with this little Chinese dragon, it seems to throw some new moves. Now, I've got to go away and think long and hard about just how lenses actually work for cutting. It's no longer a, a simple matter of well the short focus lenses have a small footprint and if you put 60 watts into a small footprint then you get a certain energy density. If you go for a longer focal length lens, the next one being two inches, it's got twice the area in its footprint therefore the energy density is half as much. And with half as much energy, you can't do as much damage. Hmm. The logic of that has fallen down badly today, and that's caused me to want to understand exactly how our lenses are working for cutting. We understand how they work for dotting now, but not for cutting. So I suppose we've reached a point where you'd like me to sum up. Very, very difficult, I have to say. Look, come in a minute and I'll show you what I mean. Used the right way round, this USA meniscus lens performed very well with dot work. Now whether it's got the focal range 
that my compound lens has got, I can't tell you at the moment because I haven't done that test work. This lens here, which is the PVD China meniscus lens, is also very good when it's used the wrong way round. It seems to be an excellent dotting lens for the money. It's a very cheap lens and it performs extremely well. As you can see here, neither of those lenses are particularly good at cutting. And I wouldn't probably recommend any one and a half inch lens for cutting. So as far as engraving is concerned, we're over here. As far as cutting is concerned, I don't think any of these one and a half inch lenses are the right thing to go for. Bear in mind, every one of these has been subjected to the same amount of power, everything is constant. And look what we get here. In terms of value for money, I don't think you're going to get better than this PVD Chinese two inch Plano convex lens. Now, I have to admit that this cutting information is not 100% complete. We could have put every one of these lenses in upside down and done a comparison to see what the cutting is. I haven't. But that may well be an exercise that I carry out on a different occasion when I'm trying to understand just what it is that makes these lenses cut. Because this doesn't make any sense at all according to the existing logic associated with lenses. And that's one of those new moves that this machine has thrown at me today. I've never thought about it before, but now I have, I can't see an easy answer. I've got to go away and do a lot of thinking. If you can come up with a solution in the meantime, help. Well, in the next session, we'll jump back onto this head because we've given it a jolly good workout today and it's come out, I think, with flying colours. So I'm very happy to leave the head on this machine. I certainly wouldn't have offered it to you guys until I'd given it a jolly good workout. Anyway, thank you very much for your time again and I'll catch up with you in the next session.